Hello, my name is Alan Foom and today I'm going to talk about petroleum reservoirs. So it's another in my basic primer series, so it's an introduction to petroleum reservoirs, what they are. Now I might be doing further videos on more specific topics covered in here in the future. So here's a petroleum system, so you've got a source rock, you've got uh, where hydrocarbons are generated in the first place, then you've got migration, hydrocarbons move out of the source rock. You have a, a trap, I have a video on traps, you have a seal to keep the hydrocarbons in the trap, so there's a video on that as well. And this is the video on reservoirs, so this is the container where hydrocarbons are stored. Now, for a petroleum system to work, for a petroleum uh, prospect to work, all of these have to work. So you have to have a reservoir, you have to have a seal, you have to have a trap, you have to have charge, and you have to have a source. All of them to work, and all of them have to work in the right, uh, right sequence. So what is a reservoir? Well, hydrocarbons are stored in porous rocks, mainly sandstones and limestones, and porosity is a percentage of the rock which is occupied by, the, by pore space which can contain hydrocarbons. So typically porosity is in 10 to 35% range. Porosity decreases with depth of burial, so when you bury a rock, it gets squashed and pores get smaller. Permeability is the ability to flow, and conductivity is how it all links up. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that, I'll also talk a little bit about sedimentology. So here are some examples of different depositional environments, I'll talk a little bit about that. And basically, when we talk about petroleum play, we're basically really talking about a reservoir with everything that comes with it. So if you're talking about, for example, the former sandstone play in the North Sea, that's where that is. If you're talking about uh, the uh, Miocene play in the Gulf of uh, Mexico, you're talking about specific reservoirs. So, um, first uh, main type of reservoir is sandstones. They represent about 60% of the world's hydrocarbon reserves. And sandstones are basically lithified sand rocks. So you get uh, uh, hard rocks such as granites eroded, then the grains that are sand sized get deposited. And sandstones are composed basically of quartz, feldspar, lithic fragments. And this is the dot classification. This is a ternary diagram. So you've got lithics here, then you've got feldspars, and then you've got quartz, and then you can plot a sandstone along here. And it depends on the source. Uh, the composition depends on the provenance. So what has been eroded to create the sandstone? They're deposited in a wide variety of environments. I'll come to that in a second. Uh, anything from sand dunes, aeolian, to deep sea turbidite flows. And they're lithified during burial compaction, diagenesis, which is chemical alteration of the rocks during burial, get cements deposited, and porosity tends to, reserve, to, tends to decline. So here's some uh, thin section and microscope of sandstones. So these are grains, and the blue is pores, and the gray is cement. And this is what uh, this roughly means. So you've got grains, pores, cements. So this is a little bit about depositional environments. So this is a diagram from, uh, from Wikipedia. So you've got uh, mountains, which where things get eroded. You've got glaciers, so you've got some glacial deposits, for example, in Algeria, in the Ordovician. It's a very major reservoir rock there. Then you have alluvial deposits on the alluvial plain, fluvials deposited by rivers, lakes, lacustrine, so for example, like the um, sea lion field in the, in the Falklands, Aeolian sand dunes, so like the Rod League in the North Sea, and tidal and deltaic and beach sand, so like the Fulmar, deltaic like the Brent province in the North Sea. And then you've got the slope, you've got slope channels, for example, uh, Nile Delta in Egypt, and then you've got deep sea fans, so for example, Gulf of Mexico, Nigeria, and many others. So you've got a system, everything coming from mountain, through the plains, to the shelf, to the deep sea. And different erosional pro uh, processes, so erosion and deposition of uh, fans. Again, quite a lot of complexity there, and, uh, but this is just a brief overview, just a brief uh, skim through. Other main type of rock are carbonates. So you've got uh, calcite and aragonites, uh, calcium, CO3, and dolomites with calcium, magnesium, and bicarbonate. Carbonates contain about a quarter of the world's sedimentary rocks, but contain 40% of the world's hydrocarbons. So they're quite a major reservoir, big reservoir in the Middle East, big reservoir in the Pre-Caspian Basin, also quite an interesting reservoir in the Santos Basin of Brazil, which is what we did not expect when we're drilling into that. Limestone precipitate out of seawater, and they also include the remains of shelly fauna. Uh, so there's quite a lot of uh, stuff with uh, regards to biota revolution. So, for example, different types of organisms that lived at different times, and they form different types of limestones. Dolomites are formed by diagenetic alteration of buried limestones, which tend to create exoporosity. They have complicated formation histories, complicated burial histories, and complicated geometry. So you've got different types of grades. So everything from mudstone, which is basically mud grade, grains, wax stones, pack stones, 
which are more skeletal remains, and grainstones, which are larger grains. So this is a Dunham classification of limestones. Here are some thin sections that were posted on the uh, social media by Cambridge Carbonates. Please follow them if you're interested in carbonates. They really are the world experts that really know what, uh, what they're on about, so please follow them. A little bit about depositional environments. So this is a paper by my former colleague, Jim Hendry, an open source paper. So you've got reefs, you've got aprons, you've got beaches, etc. And what you're really looking for, the best reservoirs tend to be, tend to be reefs, our carbonate platforms, which come in all sorts of different shapes and sizes. And again, they have complicated histories, complicated diagenesis. In fact, you really want to talk to this guy. So this is Paul Wright, Professor Paul Wright, former colleague of mine, explaining carbonate sedimentology to the Queen. He's a really good expert, so please have a, have a chat with him if you really need to know more about this. Fractured basement reservoirs, they're a bit of a minority. They're quite rare, but they do get quite a lot of attention. So basically, this is what happens when a, um, a hard rock piece of basement gets... Uh, um, basically uh, becomes prominent, it then becomes weathered, um, the weathering creates fracture networks, could be aided by some tectonic faulting, and this fracture porosity can then be filled with hydrocarbons, but it's hard to model, hard to predict reservoir uh, performance. So here are two examples, uh, this is um, a video by Trove on the back hoe field in Vietnam, which is a granitic reservoir, please check this one out. And this is an example from uh, West of Shetlands, the um, Lancaster field, which had quite a few problems in terms of prediction. Uh, again, difficult to predict, but can be very valuable. A little bit about sequence stratigraphy, which is how to, you're trying to work out how uh, these things happen. So basically, the, it, the sedimentological cycle goes through a, a sequence. So you have, at, uh, you have a low stand, which is where sea level is low. You get quite a lot of erosion, but deposition in the deep basin. Then you have um, transgressive which is when sea level rises. And then you have a high stand where sea level is at the top and you get more deposition. Again, what you're looking for is when these uh, uh, sediment waves prograde into the basin. Uh, this is what we call top set. So for example, a Nanashuk sandstone in Alaska. And when you have a low stand, you have uh, what we call bottom sets, like the Torok sandstone in Alaska. So sequence boundary, erosional base at the sequence, low stand, relatively low sea level, transgressive, Rising sea level covers more of the area. Maximum flooding surface, where the uh, sea level is at its highest. And then a high stand, where sediment basically overwhelms the capacity of the basin to absorb it. And you get sediment building out into the basin. So this is a little more in sequence stratigraphy. So this is um, a diagram in true space. So again, low stand fans, transgressive sea systems tract, high stand sea systems tracts prograding outwards, and then sequence boundary at the bottom, sequence boundary at the top, maximum flooding surface in the middle. And this is a Wheeler diagram, which is looking at it in geological time, where sediments would have been deposited. So that's the low stand out in the basin. And then you've got um, the high stand going out from the uh, hinterland into the basin. And this is the evolution. So you've got transgression, which is when sea levels rise, regression when sea levels fall. Again, it deserves another video unto itself, but this is a basic introduction. So once you've got your reservoir, you need to try to understand it. So reservoir layering, looking at how different uh, parts of the reservoir all link up. So these are log correlations. Again, this is a sequence stratigraphic framework within a log correlation. And you're looking for layers that have roughly similar pro uh, properties, lateral and vertical continuity, try to build your reservoir model, understand your reservoir architecture. Net to gross ratio, we've got a video on this uh, on my channel. And that's basically the proportion of rock within your hydrocarbon prospect, the hydrocarbon discovery, which is actually true reservoir. So the non-net are things like shales, very tight rocks that don't contribute to the overall volume. So that's the volumetric equation, net to gross, which is where that is within that. Uh, tanks versus pancakes. So you've got reservoir layers, some of which can be very thin, very laterally extensive. For example, some parts of uh, deep sea fans. You've got some layers which amalgamates. So you've got channels that go through and channels intercut uh, the different layers to come up with a, um, with a more coherent unit. And high net to gross tends to have more, more rock, more channels, more sheet floods. Low net to gross tends to be a bit more separated. Um, the individual units can be tens meters thick, can be even hundreds of meters thick, but into individual unit all clings together if they if they erode into each other. So impacts on recovery. So if you've got a high net to growth system, you get more recovery. 
more linkage. If you've got layered net to gross systems, you may have isolated units. Again, something you need to understand when you're looking at the reservoir. Porosity, basically more porosity, more fluids. Percentage of the rock, which is voids. and But the pores can be filled with either brine or hydrocarbons or maybe even non-hydrocarbon gases. You know, for example, helium, uh, hydrogen is becoming a, a big topic right now. So again, part of the volumetric equation. And the different porosity types. Sandstones are relatively simple. You either get fractures or intergranular porosity. Sometimes you get micro porosity as well. It's also the APG wiki. Uh, carbonates tend to be a bit more complicated. So related to uh, interpolitical moldic, so this is dissolved uh, uh, shells effectively, various fractures, etc. So again, uh, please talk to Cambridge Carbonates or Paul. The different processes that uh, create porosity or, de or destroy it. Uh, this is again from APG Wiki by Kay Nixon. So again, depth of burial, as you bury rocks, porosity, uh, they get squished, porosity gets less, and you get um, a lower quality reservoir. So effectively, depth of burial is, a, is, a, is an issue. And each type of rock will have its own burial curve. For example, chalks have a, in the North Sea have a burial curve, sandstones have a burial curve. And you have different, uh, poros different porosity destructing, destructive uh, process, for so example, cementation, cement, filling in, uh, filling, in hole, filling in the pores, and compaction, which is the main one. Uh, but you'd also have some porosity forming processes. Generally, they tend to be in carbonates where uh, ground waters tend to dissolve uh, uh, shells, etc., within the uh, within the uh, limestone fabric. Permeability, again, uh, done by Henri Darcy. Uh, who was not known to Jane Austen, as far as I know. I got a video on permeability, but it's the ability of uh, fluids to throw through a material. And this is Darcy's Law Equation. Got a video on that. Permeability is measured in Darcy's, mostly milli Darcy's, to be honest. And this is a diagram showing the different permeabilities of different rocks. So again, if you've got uh, casts and fractures, they can flow very, very fast, you know, in the Darcy, multi-Darcy scenario. So if you're drilling into cast, you really have got a problem. Sandstones tend to be, you know, a few Darcy's at the very, very best to a few milli Darcy's at the very, very worst. Then you have tight gas, less than a milli Darcy. Then you have shales and then you have potential seal rocks that are, that are here, such as uh, cemented chalk, silty shale, cemented shales and halite rock salt at the, at the best. So again, Darcy's to try to understand where the porosity is. So basic summary, reservoirs are a key part of, of the petroleum system. And this is just a basic skim through video just to try to, to set the scene. Generally formed sedimentary rocks, sandstone and carbonates, and then very many, very sedimentary environments. Everything from uh, glacial, aeolian, fluvial, deltaic, littoral, and then going out to the deep sea turbidites for sandstones. And again, reefs, platforms um, for carbonates. Porosity is a key thing with the reservoir. Essentially, the rock composed of voids is the capacity to hold drag carbons and permeability for uh, the rock to flow fluids. Layering connectivity can be so very simple, can be very complicated. Again, a uh, massive subject. But the key point here is understanding the reservoir is the key to successful field development and also successful exploration. So thank you very much. Please like, please subscribe, and I'll see you on the next one.